My name is Brittany Jarno, and I am the public policy manager here at WTIA. WTIA is the largest tech industry association in the United States with over a thousand members, ranging from small cutting edge startups to large Fortune 500 companies, all dedicated to creating a, an equity centered tech sector that supports thriving communities. Welcome to today's policy speaker series webinar on closing the digital divide and the impacts of the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act on that effort. Uh, a special thank you to the elected officials and members of the press attending today. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers. First, Maria Brown, a partner at Davis Wright Tremaine, uh, the sponsor for today's event, will set the scene and introduce our keynote speaker, U.S. Representative Marilyn Strickland. Following her speech, uh, we will have a panel talk about the implementation of the law and impacts in Washington state. Um, and so without further ado, please go ahead, Maria. Thank you, Brittany. Well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Maria Brown and I'm a partner in the Washington DC office of Davis Wright Tremaine, a sponsor of Washington Technology Industry Association and today's event. My practice focuses on infrastructure deployment and accessibility. And so I am pleased to offer a few thoughts in anticipation of our program today, as I, alongside our entire communications practice group at the firm are working on these issues every day. I have been fortunate to have worked alongside cable companies, CLEX, wireless telecoms, and gas providers in their efforts to build and expand broadband networks, including to unserved and underserved areas. And we've come a long way since the 90s when I started in this space, when internet was dial up and mobile connections were even slower. Broadband first started to replace dial up in the early 2000s and by 2007, half of all internet users had a broadband, broadband connection. Today, 98% of US households have access to broadband at speeds of 25 up three down or faster. However, approximately 24 Americans still lack access to high-speed internet, and many more cannot, cannot connect due to gaps in digital equity, equity and literacy and or because even steeply discounted services are still not affordable. In recent years, the Federal Communications Commission and Congress have taken significant steps to address this digital divide. In 2019, the FCC established the $20.4 billion Rural D Digital Opportunity Fund, also called RDOF, to bring high-speed fixed broadband service to rural homes and small businesses that lacked it. And thanks to the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, $65 billion additional fu federal funding is being deployed to bring broadband to every American household as part of the largest public investment to connect Americans since the creation of the interstate highway system. Many of DWT's clients are ARDA fund recipients, and these and others also hope to partner with states that are participating in NTIA's broadband equity access and deployment program. As they do, they will look to regulators to remove some of the existing barriers that exist to meeting the program's goals to bridge the digital divide as quickly as possible. With that, I thank you for joining us today. I know that today's program will be thoughtful and informative, and I would like to introduce you to Congresswoman Marilyn Strickland, who proudly represents Washington's 10th Congressional District. Born in Seoul, South Korea, Congresswoman Strickland is the first African American and Korean American to represent Washington State and the Pacific Northwest at the federal level. As the daughter of a veteran and a former mayor, Congresswoman Strickland brings a deep-seated passion for service to her work on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and House Armed Services Committee. She is the only African-American woman to serve on the House Armed Services Committee and is a member of both the Congressional Black Caucus and Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. She came to Congress to ensure that government works for the South sound and serves as a voice for traditionally underrepresented communities as we re rebuild the economy that works for all of us. Thank you and welcome, Ms. Uh, Congresswoman Strickland. 
Okay, well, thank you very much to WITA and to Davis Wright for hosting this. Um, it's my honor to be here today. If my screen and background look a little odd, I'm actually just off of the House floor where we have been doing a big series of votes for the National Defense Bill, which this year really focuses on families. But we're here to talk about the digital divide. So when I think about the term digital divide, it's something I've heard about for years, even back in the day when getting access to the internet was a screeching sound through AOL. With that said, in 2022, um, there are a few things that we learned, and this, a lot of this came during the pandemic. You know, during the pandemic, when children were not in school, you would hear stories about online learning but also stories about students pulling up to a parking lot in a fast food place or near a mall because they did not have internet access. And there are a couple of things we know when we talk about the digital divide. And there, there are definitely gaps when it comes to your household income, your race and ethnicity. And those gaps are pretty consistent with some of the gaps that we see in other areas, whether it is you know, household wealth or access to jobs that pay well, even access to healthcare. So we know that, you know, unfortunately, when we look at zip codes, there are disparities. Now, it's one thing to build out the system and say everyone has access, but we also know that people have to be able to afford the service as well. And then on top of that, there's a conversation about digital literacy. I think about rural communities that don't have health care, for example. And so having high speed Internet access really is what you need to fully function in society in the 21st century. It's how people pay bills. It's often how people register to vote. It's how they get access to health care. It's how students do homework and pay attention in school. It's how parents can check up on their students' grades and attendance. It's how we pay bills. I mean, there's just so much that we do right now with high-speed broadband. And so as we think about the infrastructure bill that we passed, there are a few things that I want to remind us of. Number one, it was, in fact, a bipartisan bill. So despite what you hear most of the time, there are moments when Congress can come together and work on a bipartisan basis. The other thing that's important, too, that we looked at this as a job bill. There's a reason it's called the IJJA, because one of the J's stands for jobs. And this is about providing opportunities for people to work to build our country. And this is roads, bridges, clean water, and yes, high-speed broadband is also actually part of that. It also includes transit. It also includes investing in electric vehicle charging stations in a way that we have not before. So this is a very comprehensive bill, but the broadband aspect of it is so incredibly important. You know, as I think about, you know, how we move forward as a nation, technology continues to be a big part of what we do. In many cases, having access to technology is how people become founders and come up with big ideas and apps that they develop. And again, when we talk about equity, Yes, it's about access to broadband, having this service in your home, being able to afford it, but also as a launching pad to how these things can lead to economic security and economic opportunity for as many people as possible. Through the IJJA, or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, Washington State will get about $100 million. And it's going to address the fact that 8.9% of the population does not have access to high-speed internet. So I think that turns out to be around 250,000 people. We are being very intentional with this because the money will go to the Washington State Department of Commerce in various tranches. So it's not gonna come in one giant lump sum, but we wanna make sure that one important thing is happening, that this money is being deployed and it's being deployed in the way we intended. This is a historic, historic investment when it comes to infrastructure. Um, back when I was mayor from 2010 to 2017, we would come to Congress and lobby every year and talk about an infrastructure bill, an infrastructure bill. And finally, we have done one. And so when I think about the accomplishment of this presidential administration and this Congress, this is a really big deal, but we understand how significant it is to have broadband access. You know, and we think about what's happened during the pandemic right now. You know, there are many things that happened. You know, people left the workforce, mainly women, because they didn't have the ability to have access to child care, elder care, and a lot of people who care for their disabled relatives at home. Two million women left the workforce. As people think about what it means in a most, mostly post-pandemic world, People are thinking about different models of going back to work. A lot of people are working from home. And if you want to work from home, if we want the ability to work from home to be equitable, people need access to high-speed internet. And so I think about the last two years of this country coming out of a pandemic, 
this recession, the investments that we have made in the American Recovery Act, in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, we have this opportunity to really look at equity through the lens of technology and also asking ourselves, how does that move us forward? We know that when we talk about people who come up with big ideas for apps, and having access to the internet is so important to do that. And for me, in addition to having access to high-speed broadband, there's a conversation they had about you know how we are financing and helping founders with venture capital money. So this is about access at home, being able to participate in society, education, economic opportunity, access to healthcare, access to voting rights, so much. But I think it's a very exciting development for this country. I am so proud that we have done this. And when people ask me, you know, what's your priority for now? We passed the bill, but now we need to make sure that the money gets deployed exactly as intended. Our overall goal here is to find ways to address these big challenges. The ability to work from home will address climate change. The ability to work from home will actually help families be more stable if that's an option for employers. The ability to work from home, again, just provides you with more economic opportunities. And at the end of the day, here's what we want in this country. We want every person to have access to a job that pays well. We want students to do well in school. We want people to have access to health care. And we want people to be able to retire with dignity. I will talk about one issue that doesn't get a lot of attention, and we talk about the digital divide. And that's the fact that a lot of people who are older don't necessarily feel comfortable when it comes to using the internet and technology. And so as we think about equity, I wanna make sure that we are not engaging in age discrimination and think about how we can engage our elders who may not be that comfortable with technology and help demystify it so it truly is accessible for all people. So thank you for letting me be here today. Um, thank, you for <laughs> thank you for letting me come off the house floor and do this from a very small cloakroom just off the US house floor. But I appreciate the work that you're doing and I just thank you so much for the work that you do. I know that you are dedicated to equity. I know you're dedicated to economic opportunity for all people. And let's look at how we can use technology as a tool for good that will improve the lives of people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Representative. Um, we really appreciate your time. And again, on a, on a busy vote day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, now we will have our panel join us. Our moderator today is Glenda Becker Venter, um, Director of Federal Relations at Washington State University. And our panelists are Beth Cooley, Assistant Vice President of State Legislative Affairs at CTIA, and Alex Menard, uh, Vice President and State Legislative Council at NCTA. We will have time for questions for this panel at the end of the discussion. Please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. And with that, I will pass it over to Glenda. Thank you, Brittany. And thank you so much for um, having Congresswoman Strickland come and speak with us today. We are so grateful for the work she's done um, since she's been in Congress to support Washington State University, our students, faculty, staff, and especially with the Infrastructure and Jobs Act that went through. Um, I wanted to just kind of address, first of all, why is Washington State University here hosting this today? Because uh, you know we are the land grant institution in the state and our main campus is in Pullman, Washington. But our reach is further than that. We have five physical campuses, one global campus, and research and extension centers in every county of the state. Um, we saw firsthand during the beginning of the pandemic as Washington State was at the, at the forefront of this, what the impact was on our students and our faculty that were teaching our students uh, and getting through to have um, for, affordable and accessible internet access. And actually, we're, we're on the forefront of providing hotspots to our students who are having to go to our extension offices to actually sit in cars like the Congresswoman was talking about and, and have their uh, and continue to pursue their education. Um, you know, we're looking forward to a really good conversation today. We have two experts here that can help us walk through some of the things we should be thinking about at home in Washington State as we're uh, as we're as we're starting to see the investment from the federal government come to the Department of Commerce. Uh, so, and, and we're and we're excited about this because not only is it going to continue the opportunities and provide access for um washingtonians in rural and underserved areas but it's going to continue to help support the economic growth that we um we need to continue seeing in the state so let me turn it over to beth cooley who is the assistant vice president for state legislative affairs with ctia and have her talk a little bit with us um give us an overview around the jobs act and um some of the programs that we should be watching in washington 
Thanks, Beth. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you, WTIA, uh, WTIA and Congresswoman Strickland for her leadership and the passage of this important act. Um, I'm going to talk today uh, about the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, or IIJA, uh, but specifically the BEAD program within that bill. And BEAD stands for the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. Now, we love our acronyms in DC, so Glenda, keep me honest, we'll be, we'll, you know, be going through those acronyms. So the BEAD program is a $42.45 billion program with a clear objective in the JOBS Act of connecting all Americans to high-speed internet with an emphasis on those who are unserved. Each state or ter ter territory only has a finite amount of money to reach all of these homes, and it will take all available technologies to make that happen. The B program will be distributing $100 million to each state, $100 million to Puerto Rico, and the remaining territories will also divide up an additional $100 million. Additional funding will then be uh, distributed after the FCC releases its updated broadband maps, which are expected in the fall. A formula will then be developed after these FCC maps are released, which will identify those unserved areas for additional funding. Now, the first major milestone for the states and territories in the BEAD program was the letter of intent, which was to be submitted to NTIA, which is the federal agency overseeing this program. Those letters are due by July 18th. Now, Washington State um, has already submitted this letter. And in fact, NTIA just announced yesterday that every state and territory has indicated they will be participating in the BEAD program. So a little bit more um, on the funding within the BEAD program and who should be funded first per the JOBS Act. So unserved, what is an unserved area? By statute, the JOBS Act identifies an unserved area as a household that has no access at all or access under 25.3 megabits per second. So that's 25 up, three down. Then underserved, which is no access to 100 over 20 megabits per second. And then also a prioritization of community anchor institutions like your hospitals, your libraries uh, without gigabit connections. Now the projects themselves for these broadband networks, again, the priority is the unserved areas. We should also think as a state, be thinking about targeting high poverty and poverty persistent areas. Also, in terms of build time, the, job, the JOBS Act does note that the network must be deployed and begin offering service within four years of receiving funds. So that's an important component to think about as well as you're thinking about these funds. Now, NTIA uh, recently released guidance for the BEAD program. In that guidance, also called the NOFO or the Notice of Funding Opportunity, it does highlight fiber connectivity. But NTIA does also reserve the rights of states or emboldens the states, empowers the states um, to select broadband uh, funding projects featuring other types of technologies that take into account other factors like overall cost, time to build, potential return on investment, and economic benefits like the Congresswoman was just talking about. Specifically, each state or territory is able to set its own extremely high cost per location threshold. So for example, if the cost to deploy fiber exceeds this cost threshold, or if a fiber project is not proposed altogether, the state or territory can select an alternative non-fiber, less costly broadband technology. So having said that, just a, a quick overview, it's imperative as states and territories move forward using these truly once in a generation uh, federal funds, that the path forward includes all types of technologies capable of bridging the digital divide. A technologically neutral approach that supports fiber, wireless, and other non-fiber technologies will allow the country to achieve the greatest benefit from this program by promoting competition, which at the end of the day is what is the best outcome for the broadband consumer. So that's just a little bit on the BEAD program. I'm gonna turn it over to my panelist, Alex at NCTA to talk about digital equity. Alex. Thanks Beth. And thanks to WTIA, um, the Congresswoman and Davis Wright for sponsoring this. Happy to join um, and have this conversation. So you heard from Beth, one of the programs that NTIA is responsible for coming out of the JOBS Act. There is also another program with another $2.75 billion um, related to digital equity. And you heard the Congresswoman rightly highlight that there is another component of the digital 
digital divide. It's not just whether or not the network is in that area, it's whether the people living there either can afford to connect to that network or know how to use that network. Um, and so this program is kind of a, a complementary and builds on the program that Beth just described. So I, I have heard NTIA describe the B program um, just as Beth did, but also emphasize that one of those letters stands for equity. And then they have this other pot of money that is going to go to the states um, and others, as I'll describe shortly, that is also focused on equity. And they've encouraged states to look at this holistically. So if you think about you know, opportunities for, for how to approach this funding, there's both the B program and all of the requirements there. There is also guidance that um, NTIA has released on this Digital Equity Act. So the first step is for states to apply for planning funds to create their digital equity plans. Um, and that was due on July 12th, so the other day. Um, and within the next year, states will have to come up with a plan on how they uh, are going to approach these digital equity issues. Um, and it looks like Washington is eligible for a little more than a million dollars to, to take care of that. Um, then once NTIA signs off on the plan, there will be uh, 1.44 billion for states to implement these capacity grant programs, um, which are block grants to the, to the state and the state can um, award them to sub grantees to take care of the digital equity concerns or um, do it themselves. And then the third component of the program is something called um, com competitive grants, which will go to um, non-state applicants in areas where the state has not addressed some issues. And that's another $1.25 billion. These are kind of sequential things, but something that the state has to think about as it's developing its speed, um, plan. It also has to think about how it's going to address this. And um, there are certain covered populations that that NTIA wants the states to focus on. The Congresswoman mentioned um, aging populations. That is something that NTIA has highlighted, as well as low income households, incarcerated individuals, veterans, those with disabilities, those with language barriers, racial and ethnic minorities, and rural inhabitants. And what can states do with this money? They can use the money to reach all of those people who have not signed up for broadband. Um, and while cost has been an issue um, with all of this funding that is out there, um, there are a lot of providers who are participating in federal programs that effectively make the cost um, free to low income um, individuals. And so what else can the state do to make sure that those folks know what to do with broadband. So digital literacy programs um, and, and the like. And I don't know, Glenda, if you want me to off ramp here because <laughs> it could go on forever. Um, but it, um, just, just know that, that those are, are you know, the program that Beth described, which is primarily focused on deployment, um, but has a component about um, getting folks to sign up and this digital equity component um, that has additional funding and NTIA is encouraging states to, to look at both of those holistically as they think through how they're going to approach this. Thanks, Alex. And I, I am, I'm going to ask a few questions, but I want to just put this back out there to our, uh, our viewers and participants that are viewing that, that they should feel free to put questions in the Q&A and we will make sure that they get read and, and asked. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask um, both of you is if I am a um, if I'm in an area that is underserved or if I am working with somebody in this area that is representing me where and I am underserved, how can I engage in this process? How what is the ability for me as a citizen of Washington State to work with whomever the appropriate person is to make sure that they understand that we're we're dealing with these issues in my community? Sure, Alex, you want me to. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we're, from CTI's perspective, we're watching this nationwide. And so every state's going to do this a little differently, it seems like. Um, since we don't have someone from Washington Broadband Office, I, I know that they're going to be the point entity for Washington State. So whether it is a rulemaking um, or there's a legislative process, it may just be a rulemaking, but there is opportunities to work at that process. So what I would say is, 
Linda, to your question about living in an unserved area, find out who your contact is, is at the Washington State Broadband Office to make sure that you're being heard, that you either have concerns or you, you know, want to be connected, whatever it is, this is intended to be collaborative. And the other thing I would say is that NTIA has said that there is going to be one person per state or territory to work with them because they want to make sure you're getting these funds and there's proper oversight and the funds go where they are needed. So I think it's imperative local governments, counties work with the Washington State Broadband Office to make sure that your concerns, if there are any, are being heard. That would be the best advice I would have. Yeah, and in addition to the, I think they're calling it the federal broadband officer um, that each state will get assigned, NTIA will be reviewing these state plans and making sure that the state broadband office proactively went out and did coordination. So it's you know incumbent on you to raise your hand and make sure your voice is heard, but it's also incumbent on the, the state broadband office to go out and make sure that all of these different populations are, are part of the planning process. Thanks, Alex and Beth. And Beth, you, you mentioned that you're uh, at, at CTIA, you are watching this nationally, big picture on how states are dealing with this. Is there any, but are there any best practices or advice you would give Washington State in doing this from lessons learned that you've seen so far? Um, one thing I would say, uh, being involved in the process in Oregon, they're still very early in their process, but they are doing um, listening tours kind of all over the state hearing from different constituents groups, whether it's tribal lands, um, aging population, uh, students, et cetera. So that's a great first step, just to hear what are, what are the problems, right? What problems are we trying to solve? Um, so that's early in the process. Some of the other states that, um, I don't want to say that anyone's behind because this is all new, but some states have you know, broadband offices, other states have agencies within like a Department of Commerce that's just going to be handling this. So Virginia, Commonwealth of Virginia, um, they're, they're very far ahead. And in fact, I believe they may be the only state that has already spent all their ARPA money because we still got that in the pipe. Uh, West Virginia is also far ahead. Um, and I'd also point to North Carolina, which recently um, the governor just signed the state budget on Monday, which is adapting its existing state grant program to hopefully get ready for BEAD, but to set up essentially metrics or criteria on how a state, uh, on a locality or a county, excuse me, can weigh these broadband grant applications. So that takes into consideration of yes, speed, which, you know, speed in terms of upload, download, but also speed to deployment. How many households are you going to cover? What's the cost per household? Are you also providing mobile broadband in addition to home broadband? So it's sort of a metric or a grading system, if you will, that will allow each um, county or locality to determine what their needs are. Um, and that was just enacted uh, in the North Carolina budget. So that, that's also another um, model, or I don't want to say model, but another state to look to. Lessons learned are helpful for us yeah. as we're implementing this for sure. Alex, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, I, I'd agree with Beth that there are, there are states that are further along in the process. Um, I think certainly states that have had um, experience granting um, broadband awards in the past will have a leg up as they pivot to, you know, this specific program. Um, I think, you know, the, the coordination amongst the different government agencies is going to be very important, right? Um, Beth mentioned that there's already billions of dollars out there um, that has gone towards broadband from prior acts of Congress. Um, and it is gonna be incumbent on the state to make sure that they know where those wards were made by states and localities, because in prior programs, there were some counties and cities that got funding for broadband and to be the most efficient and make this money stretch as, as far as it possibly can, they're gonna wanna make sure that they recognize areas where there has already been a commitment made by the state, by the federal government, by the, the county or, or city to make sure that you're not basically dupli dupl duplicating that um, funding. You know, one thing that that has, um, I think for the general public, and that may not really be for this audience, but one of the things that folks have had a difficult time kind of wrapping their heads around is the difference between rural and underserved. I mean, we have communities in Washington state in particular that are within 45 minutes of major metropolitan areas that have no access. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about how you all, or what you all have heard from the from the federal side of things about how those issues are going to be addressed? And I know we talked a little bit about mapping earlier, and the FCC is looking at, you know, new new ways to do some to to ensure that those areas are taken into consideration. So, can you talk a little bit more about how what you're hearing from the federal side about how those things are coming along? Sure. So the the FCC is is undertaking this monumental task of mapping every single location in the country, and then um, providers will overlay their service area on top of that, and that will um, identify with more granularity than we've ever had insight to before locations that are unserved. And I think. You know, as Beth laid out the statute, it's unserved, underserved, and then there are other uses that the state can put the money to. There is a rurality component to this, um, and that's mostly going to come out, I think, when the state identifies that extremely high cost threshold. But if you have, you know, a location that is unserved and it's in an exurban area or a suburban area, it's it's still going to be eligible for funding. Now, a state might want to approach that differently, right? There are going to be pockets that are uncovered as unserved, and maybe the most efficient way to connect those is to get the surrounding providers to just edge out, right? They haven't edged out to this point because the economics didn't work. With a little bit of funding, you can just make your network go a little further. Then there are going to be areas where it's you know wide swaths of a county that are completely unserved, and you might approach that through maybe a more traditional competitive grant program to get new entrants into that area. Um, we have a question. So I'm going to read the question out loud, which is, how can people who do have access to fast broadband internet help promote VEED in the implementation of fast broadband to the rest of the state? That's a good question. question. Um, well, I'll, I'll take first swing at that. Um, can I add one more thing to that? I mean, are there are other states that have are doing that, and can again, I mean, I keep going back to lessons learned on this, but are, have you seen successes with, you know, with implementing this question in other areas of the country? So on the bead front, not yet, and that's because the letters of intent are due next week, so we're still early in the process there. Um, once those letter of intent uh, are submitted, since they are everywhere, then $5 million is going to go out to help for staffing. So there's not really funds yet for BEAD specifically. What I will say, though, and that is a great question. Um, one part of the BEAD program is the affordability piece, which is the ACP or the Affordable Connectivity Program. In order to uh, participate in the BEAD program, whoever is applying for the money has to participate in the ACP, which provides a low income broadband option for folks. Um, every one of CTIA's wireless carrier members participate in the ACP. What I have, done, have seen from the state perspective is states are advertising proactively the ACP. Sign up, please take advantage of this. Um, so having roundabout gotten to the answer to the question, um, once BEAD starts becoming more deployed and money starts flowing, I do think that is a great role and a great use of some of the bead money is to advertise this program. Um, Alex, I don't know if you disagree. I can't recall anything in the statute that says a state can't use the funds for those purposes. I absolutely agree. Um, <laughs> had to find the mute button. Um, and you know, all of NCTA's members are also participating in the ACP program, and this comes out of a a program that was set up as an emergency program during the pandemic that Congress kind of made more permanent um, through the, the IAJA. Um, and I, I think, you know, so what can you do now? I think Beth is completely right. This is a program where money is going out the door now. We don't have to wait for states to do plans or set up programs. This is a program run by the FCC. Most of the country's existing ISPs are already participating. Our members are doing as much outreach as they possibly can, um, but it's still maybe not as fully subscribed as, as it could be. And I think you know this is is part of a conversation that that maybe we can have either now or later. Um, that I was getting towards when I was talking about the Equity Act issue, right? Like there's a couple of things that prevent those who could have access or do have access to broadband who have not subscribed. 
One is cost. And I think for the most part, ACP kind of takes that off the table. Um, it's a $30 subsidy. All of my members are, are offering 100 megabits per second per month for, for $30. So if, if you get that money from the FCC, you're effectively getting broadband for free. Um, there are instances where a state may want to use some B money or, or um, the Equity Act money to kind of supplement that um, subsidy. But if you take cost off the table, there are still other populations that have not subscribed um, and, and don't know why they want to subscribe. And so it is incumbent on all of us to make sure that folks understand how to use the service, why they need to use the service. Um, and a part of that is, I think my members who have been doing a lot of this on their own for the last 10 years have come to understand is sometimes you need a, a more trusted partner to communicate that to um, certain communities, right? Like it's not enough for my member Comcast or Charter to go out and say, hey, here's a free service from the government. Um, you need someone who who maybe is a more trusted community partner. The anecdote that I, I have heard and I, I like to repeat is that someone um, put up an ACP flyer in a apartment building that said, you know, $30 off your, your um, broadband bill, sign up here. And then someone had subsequently come through and written fraud across it, right? Free broadband, it seems too good to be true, must be some sort of scam. And so you need someone um, in the community who can communicate to um, eligible folks, this is, this is a program that you can, can sign up for and, and here's why it's good and useful. You know, Alex, that's a really good point. And from the WSU perspective, we hear that a lot in our communities where we have extension offices. And we have extension, like I mentioned earlier, across the state in all 39 counties. And those, those organizations have become trusted sources of information and have become even more so through the pandemic. Um, and we have been utilizing um, the expertise in those counties, for example, up in Northeast Washington through a broadband action team that has pulled together a community group of, of local state um, county officials um, to actually try to wrap their hands around the best way to get service up to that uh, rural underserved and community where you have a lot of those folks up there that are um, are, are probably more inclined to be a little bit more um, hesitant to believe that free broadband is really an option when it is. So I think, you know, for our Washington folks that are watching this, WSU is happy to work with um, the State Department of Commerce, the broadband office, and our, our providers out there to get that message out utilizing extension. And I would encourage, you know, it's something to think about as we're talking to other institutions around the country as well. Alex, you want to mute? Did you want to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say, and, and those are all kind of allowable uses of these, these funds, right? This is exactly what NTIA has said they have in mind is that communities coming together, a, an institution like WSU kind of taking a lead and making sure that folks know about you know that. And the Congressman mentioned digital literacy, making sure that, that there are opportunities to train people on how to use the computer, how to use the internet, teaching them about you know online privacy and cybersecurity. All of those are things that, that these um, programs are, are designed to address. Yeah, just to put a finer point on that, I would say um, in New York State, as a native upstate New Yorker, so I'm going to plug my own state, um, the, the governor did a great job in advertising the ACP. She put it out there um, to increase subscribership and signups. Um, so coming from a credible voice, whether it's the Washington Broadband Office or Glenda, your institution, that would be great um, because we do want to encourage you know, folks to use this subsidy. That's what it's for. Thanks. And, and Alex, you actually inadvertently answered one of the questions I was going to ask you about how do we, you know, the implementation of the digital literacy programs. And maybe we can expand a little bit more on that. What to expect from NTIA on this and how they anticipate the literacy part of this to be actually implemented. If we know. <laughs> this is where Beth and I are somewhat hamstrung in that that we have read all of the same things that everybody else has read. Um, I think it, it remains to be seen. What I have heard NTIA say for both of these programs, I think, is that you know they view their charge from Congress as setting guardrails on the states, and within those guardrails, the state has 
some amount of flexibility to, to implement the programs. And so, you know, Washington State may choose to implement that in a way that's slightly different from a Rhode Island or something. That's Ditto great. what Anne said. <laughs> Ditto. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of um, guidance that will continue to be forthcoming, candidly, yeah. and frequently yeah. asked questions. And so we're still waiting through that. But Alex did a great job. What about um, opportunities to achieve the last mile connectivity? What are we anticipating with that? So, I guess I'll take first crack if you don't mind, Alex. Um, sure. You know, this is really where I see wireless shines. Yes, my members, but they, you know, again, going back to the intent of the Jobs Act, it's to connect the unserved, right? And oftentimes that last mile is the most expensive when we're talking about those unserved folks who are truly rural. Um, and so what, you know, the wireless industry, we have 5G for home broadband or fixed wireless access which essentially gives you a two for one. You're enhancing your, your mobile broadband, but also you're getting your home broadband too. And the benefits of this is number one, it re reduced deployment costs by up to 40% versus fiber to the home. Because the way this solution works, you don't even need a technician. You literally get a cable style router that you, know, you place in your window. You don't even need a technician, can be done in an hour and it communicates with a nearby uh, macro tower. You know, those 200 foot towers you see along the side of the highway. So you're getting home broadband and enhanced mobile broadband as well. And in fact, this is being aggressively deployed today. The, uh, the biggest home broadband provider today is actually a wireless carrier. So this is a really exciting development, particularly with 5G and new spectrum that has been brought online. But this is an excellent rural solution to think about as you're talking about that last mile connectivity. Because again, that can be the most expensive and timely part of finishing, creating a broadband network. Yeah, and I think, you know, NCTA was supportive of IAJ as a, a technology neutral um, bill. I think there are some maybe curious parts where NTIA seems to put its thumb on the scale of fiber deployment. And in almost every instance, my, my members in this, you know, when they do a new deployment, they're going to use fiber. But Earlier today, NCTA did a blog post on some of the, the fixed wireless um, solutions that some of our members are doing in rural areas. And I think this is a, a both a to be determined in all of that forthcoming guidance that Beth mentioned from NTIA, but you know, that extremely high cost threshold that the state determines, which NTIA did not provide a lot of guidance on how it sees a state establishing that the way NTIA talks about the, the last mile deployment, that's going to go a long way towards figuring out where a state does and doesn't kind of flip from fiber to fixed wireless. And, and I know that below that, we can have a conversation about whether, you know, states have the flexibility to, to be technology neutral and what that will actually look like. But um, I think that's, that's part of the, the issue. But I think at the end of the day, and Alex, you would agree with this, that having the mechanism in place from the state perspective of an all of the above approach is the appropriate way to go so that communities can choose what makes sense for their communities, right? So that they can just choose, uh, okay, well, this is gonna be faster to deploy. We wanna get this online the fastest. Um, maybe this has faster speeds, but it's gonna take a little longer, but that's our preference. I think even Alex, you would agree though, that just having the flexibility to choose and I, I think, you know, a state like Washington, which does have a significant percentage of unserved locations, is going to have to rely on not only, you know, technology variety, but provider variety, right? Like, there may or may not be an ISP willing to serve every single area. And so how, as the state, as you're designing the program, how do you incent, you know, qualified providers to show up and and compete to serve areas and, and offer kind of strong solutions that will that will give, I mean, part of what we're trying to get is consumers to, to be able to use the internet at speeds that they expect and, and can then, you know, take advantage of all the things that are on the internet. And you want to make sure that they have a service that they can rely on to do that. Agreed. I've got one last question for you all, and it's a little bit 
broad, I think. And then we'll see if anybody pops in with any other questions here from the um, from within the audience. But we talked about we've talked a lot about underserved and, and rural and things we need to look for as the NTIA come as the NTIA comes out with their guidance and how the statute def, um, defines those. Are there other definitions that we should be thinking about or looking at as Washington's is what Washington community is pulling stuff together for this that we should be aware of, I guess? It's a good question. I mean, one thing that I would flag, so unserved priority for sure. Um, and we talked about underserved too, uh, because if you look at the stats um, per the FCC, Washington state has over 540,000 uh, unserved and underserved population residents. So that's a significant number. So um, we talked a little bit about underserved, but I would say don't forget about that definition either. Because um, I mean, Glenda, you outlined it perfectly that you may have people who are in a suburban area, but they're underserved, they're getting below that 100 over 20. Um, we didn't talk about that much. So I would just flag it again. Um, and indeed, this is about unserved 100%. But don't forget about those folks either. Alex? Um, yeah, that's a, a good point to flag, Beth. Um, I don't know if there's any other specific definitions that that that's fair. Will make a difference here. <laughs> well, we I, I I am appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this panel this afternoon. It's this afternoon. It's this afternoon in DC now. And um, thank you both for your time and expertise and talking to our colleagues from Washington, the state of Washington, home, um, not Washington State University, but, um, and for WTA for, for hosting this and, and for Congresswoman Strickland for her leadership on this issue as we are trying to address something that has really been spotlighted by the, by the pandemic, but has been a topic of discussion for years in Washington State. So, um, thank you, Beth, and thank you, Alex, and thank you, Brittany, and I will turn it back to you now. Thank you. thank you so much, Glenda, and thank you so much, uh, Beth and Alex and uh, Maria and the representative as well for your time today. Thank you to all of our uh, attendees as well um, and our sponsor, Davis Wright Tremaine. If you would like more information about WTIA and our policy efforts, please visit WashingtonTechnology.org um, and have a great rest of your day.